now let's move to our panel discussion session. So for all our three speakers, uh, Alex, Mark, and Melissa, yeah, if anyone have other questions related to their project, their method, yeah, it's the time to ask. Yeah, you still can read your hand or put it in the chat. Or if something else uh, from Mark, Alex, and uh, Melissa, you want to discuss more uh, about the project, explain more, you can also use this time. We are happy to talk about um, Beth's talk. If anyone had any more questions about what she was going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, during the, the written time. Oh, yeah, uh, questions. So uh, maybe I ask one question first. So I'm very interested in this non-destructive method, extract DNA. So um, it works similarly for larvae, egg, pupae, adult fly, and also different tissues, or did you try that? Or like wings, uh, legs, or just a head? Did you have a chance to try that? So I might um, say something about that one. So, so far we've been using adult flies because we're designing okay. it to deal with trap mm -hmm. catches with this, okay. this particular non-destructive method. We've tried the other method, which is the using the, the kits with the extraction buffer and the protonase K. We've tried that on lots of different things. So we've tried that on larvae, um, mm. flies, beetles, hold of different taxa. And that, that works pretty well universally across the board. Um, okay. But as Alex was saying earlier, there's, there's some differences in efficiency and how well that works depending on how hard an insect is compared to how soft it is and other mm. things like that. So the, the non-destructive method is great. We've been focusing on that because you can go back and say, was that mm. really present in the sample? So you've got morphology to back things up, which you can always go back to those um, mm. specimens. But we, we're trying to sort of not have a method where we have to pull legs off or do processing because that also adds a lot of time. The main, mm. the main benefit of this whole approach is to save that time, the processing time. Okay. So basically your non-destructive method you designed and used on the adult flights, not on the other stage. It, it would probably work on the other stages. We've used it in other projects for example, okay. on um, Capra beetle, where we've used it on um, adults and larvae, and it works fine mm -hmm. on both life stages. Okay. There's no reason, it was actually designed, hot shot from memory was designed for mollusks. So it's used on a lot of different um, organisms. Okay, thanks, Mark. Yeah, any other question? or even any other discussion. Um, oh, yeah, good. <laughs> we got one more question from Elizabeth Fung for Melissa. Can you please explain a bit more about the eDNA swap on hot shot buffer? Yeah, uh, it was just uh, something that I tried for fun. Um, but basically I went down to the um, market access team where they keep their colonies and we just had a little like Beth had a um, it was a swab for cow noses so it was sort of like a long q-tip and I just kind of wiped it over the walls down there where the, the flies are kept and then we um, sort of dipped it in the buffer wiped it put it back in and then boiled that and I was able to get um, try an iDNA out of that and detect it in a qPCR. That was a, a try and I qPCR, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And any other question? Uh, I was just gonna say with those, um, 
following up from what Melissa was just saying, we were using the, the qPCRs to detect how well the DNA extractions were going generally. And we've done a lot of work on um, sensitivity as well. So putting one fly in amongst hundreds or thousands of other flies and the, the method, um, you can still pick, pick the individuals up within, I can't remember how many thousands we got to Melissa, but it, it's very, um, very effective. I think it was one in 20,000 in qPCR. How often do you get 20,000 flies in a trap? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, another question from Elizabeth Fong. Uh, did you try the hot shot uh, in single egg? Not, not for this project, but um, we've tried some sort of crude extraction methods for lamp, including hot shot on eggs. Um, for other organisms, other insects, and um, it works if, if there's, the issue with eggs is sometimes they don't burst and release their DNA, that can be the only thing that sort of holds that up, if they've got DNA we'll pick it up. The other crude extraction buffer we've used a lot for LAMP is a commercial product called Quick Extract, and that works really well too. Um, and it's just temperature-based extraction as well, but it's you can't upscale that to the level we need to for the fruit flies because it's expensive as well. Thanks. So, yeah, we received another question from Matt. Uh, are there still ongoing projects hunting for additional diagnostic lossy? What's the current state of play? I'll take this one. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential for using comparative genomics for finding diagnostic loads, especially these lamp assays and some of these um, types that we struggle to separate. Um, someone mentioned the, this Kim et al. paper, which developed a, um, a, di a diagnostic lamp for Drosophila suzukii. And that was, that was really well designed, I thought, because they were able to leverage all these publicly available Drosophila whole genomes to find specific genes that weren't present at all in the other species to target. Um, and that way, that's, it's a, I think it's a, a lot neater assay um, than just the trying to like um, target a gene that's conserved but has some variation. So I'm hoping um, like more and more defritted um, whole genome sequences are becoming available. So I think there is a lot of potential to go kind of beyond um, what has been done with, uh, with transcriptome comparisons and um, mm. uh, like that anchored hybrid enrichment stuff. I think um, hopefully, I don't know if there is any actual project um, ongoing, but I think there is potential um, to do to find more novel diagnostic loci. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so yeah, it reminded me another question for either lab method or metabarcoding method. So the, uh, this method can help you find the populations. Yeah, just like uh, that is Suzuki, but this Suzuki come from Europe or from other countries. Do you? Do, 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 uh, do you have any experiment or experience on that part? Um, well, with the meta barcoding, which is kind of my my role in this stuff, um, we target quite short gene regions um, and normally CO one. So there's limited genetic variation. I have seen I have seen some papers that have used um, meta barcoding methods for like detecting haplotypes and then using those in population genetic analyses. Um, we haven't really looked into it yet. I don't think it'd be possible for tifridids. Um, it may be possible for something like Drosophila suzukii. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question, I think. Um, what, what might be quite interesting, especially is um, as longer read technologies come into, into play, um, if you can target a longer gene region in metabarcoding, you might be able to capture some more of this population informative information. Um, so I think it's definitely something to 
look into in the future, um, but we haven't tried it yet. Yeah. And, I, and I think, and I was going to say with LAMP, the other side of the, the other tests we've been talking about, they're generally species specific and we struggle to make mm. them specific enough for a species sometimes. So to make them specific to populations is um, more of a challenge unless you can find, like they did with Spotowind Drosophila, unique regions in some populations. Yeah. Thanks. So any other question? Oh, good. Uh, yeah, we receive a new question from Yen Norman. Uh, the question is, if metabarcoding detects a variety of no target taxa from a particular site, where are these detections recorded? That's a good question, and it's something we're currently working on, um, how to start communicating this data. Um, like, I think ideally it would be piped into something like Atlas of Living Australia, um, but there has to be a few kind of curation steps we need to go through first. Like, first we need to just screen to see if there's any kind of biosecurity threats in there, which need to be um kind of prioritized first um i mark would probably mo know more about the status of this with the um the imap tests project which is a, a, another large meta barcoding project that's going on where one of the end goals is to communicate a lot of this data back to growers um but yeah there is a bit of a it, it would be not, I, I think it'd be nice to get this data all out there publicly um but i think it's still a work in process yeah, and I and I agree. Like I'm at PES is a good example. So you've got this, it's going to become more and more common that we start detecting sequences from things which we didn't know were here once we start looking. Um, and when those first detections come through, if it if we in our pipelines we have to run our data against um, lists of exotic species to, to detect those things so we're not releasing data that could be from exotics. And then if we do find them, we've got to report that up through the state channels so that um, things can be acted on as quickly as possible if it is an exotic. Um, but ideally you are getting all this data. That's the great thing about meta barcoding. You're getting all this, you might be looking for particular pests, but you get all this other information on all the other insects that are there. And some of those are beneficials um, or there's um, biodiversity assessments, there's all sorts of applications that could come out of this sort of meta barcoding um, data that's being generated. Yeah, um, and just, uh, just to expand on that, one of the things I didn't have time to mention, but some of the non drosophila taxa we detected um, in our pilot surveillance program around Melbourne were actually a lot of um, drosophila specialist parasitoid wasps, and kind of knowing the distribution or gaining that information on the distribution of those could. Um, nicely feed into um, like ideas for biocontrol if Prosophila Suzuki does get here in the future. Thank you. And we got a comment from Mark, uh, Mark Schultz. Uh, general observation following on from mass curly uh, question. We need to continue to resolve taxonomies of complex groups to ensure species boundaries are well understood. Building diagnostic tools around unresolved complex, uh, which where we may be dealing with the same species, uh, continues to be an issue for Tafriti. Yeah. yeah, that's um, that's definitely an important point. Um, like these these tools. Um, really depend on accurate reference sequences, which really depend on accurate reference taxonomy. So yeah, Mark's completely right. Um, these, these tools, like if, if you do have, uh, if the taxonomy is wrong, ultimately your diagnostic assay is kind of going to be wrong in a way in the end. So we need to keep paying people like Mark Schutz to resolve these lovely issues. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah, and I think that's a good point, Alex, about the, the reference databases is such a critical thing behind all of this. You've got to, you've got to have the right, um, yeah, tying stuff back to known specimens that have been identified correctly in the first place is critical to this whole approach. Yes, and people like Melissa. Yeah, so any other questions or comments from our audience or speakers? Okay, if no more questions, uh, let's thank all the speakers again for their wonderful talk. And uh, so uh, we hope everyone enjoys this conference and thank you.